it's 3 p.m. Everyone has its coffee or whatever energizing beverage you need. So you're gonna keep up with. So that might be a little bit more technical than the, the previous ones. But we're gonna talk about headless Drupal or decoupled Drupal, whatever terms uh, suits your needs. So, hi everyone. My name is Simon. I'm uh, acting as the director of technology for Evolving Web. Uh, been in Drupal field for the past 15 years or so. Uh, and I'm mostly specialized on the backend side of things, and I've been doing my share of uh, decoupled slash headless uh, infrastructure over the past uh, decade or so. A um, little, bit, uh, little bit of uh, information about Evolving Web. So we're basically designing and developing rich web experiences, and we're trying to focus on maximizing uh, the user satisfaction. So besides design and development, um, we're also kind of taking care of content strategy, accessibility, SEO, so we're basically like a full, full range of uh, uh, web-oriented services. Um, that happens that we work quite closely with, with uh, Princeton University, uh, which hosts to come today, as you know, um, uh, but also with a lot of uh, higher uh, education uh, and public organizations. Uh, we we'll have a lot of uh, experience with governments, um, and we also do a lot of uh, training, so both public trainings and uh, private training for our clients. Um, so yeah, so if you want to know more, uh, throw this sort of tiny backdrop that we set up in the corridor, so feel free to uh, kind of uh, show up at the booth and we can, we can talk more about that. So that's a glimpse at our uh, funny and uh, growing team. We're almost like 100 uh, in the company right now, and we're still like uh, constantly hiring, especially in the uh, development team, so feel free to uh, apply if, you, if you'd like. So as I said, the talk is a little bit technical. I'm gonna try my best to make it like the, the most explanatory as possible. Uh, there's, there's going to be a few like a technical slide uh, that might be a, a little bit hard to get, but I'm, I mean, you can interrupt me and ask questions. And because that content was initially uh, created for a 30 minute presentation last time, and we know, know we have 45 minutes today, I, I jumped in like, a few additional technical slides uh, in between. So uh, we'll, we'll see uh, what we can uh, get out of that. So to discuss the topic of headless Drupal, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about an actual example, like an, uh, an actual website that we developed a few uh, months ago for uh, Planned Parenthood. So I don't think there's, uh, uh, a lot to say about them, it's pretty renewed here you know, on that side of the border. I mean, uh, I had to be explaining what they do on the other side of the, the border, but here it's uh, probably been in the news a little bit uh, the, the past few months. Um, so lately, they uh, created and developed and released internally uh, uh, an application, a native application for iOS and Android to kind of be able to deliver their service closer to their audience and particularly to reach their uh, younger, uh, their younger audience. And they basically came to us because they needed, they needed uh, a website uh, to promote that app and make sure that it, it was known and, and downloaded, basically. Um, it was interesting because the, first the timeline was very short. We had three months to kind of design, develop, and release that website. Um, it's mostly static content, but they needed a CMS. They were willing to use a CMS, and their, their preference was to use open source systems, and they had prior experience with Drupal, so they were willing to kind of reuse that knowledge and use Drupal. Uh, and they wanted a high, high degree of control over the, the content publication, and as probably many of you know, so Drupal is really uh, best of class for that kind of uh, features. Um, however, their in-house team was way more knowledgeable with React than with like PHP and Drupal and Twig and uh, the, that kind of technology. Um, they were also asking for something uh, uh, that had high performance and, and that was highly secure for two reasons. Be because being like a, a little bit politically exposed organization, uh, they, they, could, they could be under like some uh, attacks from like, I don't know, activists, activists or, yeah. um, you know, uh, you have imagination. And on, on the other side, they, they were willing to have something kind of uh, performant because could possibly happen that there would be features on CNN or Fox News and then they would receive a, a huge uh, amount of traffic uh, um, uh, suddenly. Um, what can I say more on that? Uh, yeah, so, so, that's, that's basically, so that here you can see a, 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 quick, uh, a quick glance on the design that our design team released and that we used to kind of start uh, thinking about the solution. So obviously, 
And thinking about they want to use Drupal, they want to be able with React, uh, that really sounds like a natural fit for a, a decoupled project. Uh, but I guess fun fact, headless is kind of not new. Uh, it's been like a little bit more talked about in the, the past maybe five years or so, but my, my side, my first decoupled project was built in uh, 2009. It was built with Drupal 6, and the front end was based with Flash, Adobe Flash. So it's kind of a long-term experience on that, on that field. Just we're going to maybe, before diving into what a decoupled architecture is, we're going to just wait and like, take a look at how it typically works with, uh, with Drupal and with like, kind of all the PHP-based CMS uh, uh, system like WordPress, for example. Uh, so basically, when a user wants to um, uh, access a content, the browser is going to just basically ask the server for a page issuing an HTTP request. And the server, so Drupal in that case, is just going to speed out an HTML page that is going to be rendered on the, on the screen. And that, that path is basically it. That's the, the end of the flow, and then whenever you click on a link, you're in some repeat. However, where, when we're talking about more a web application instead of a website, it's a bit different because instead of loading a page, you're going to load an app that's going to start and leave inside the browser. And then instead of requesting pages from the server, it's going to actually request data to uh, something that's more an API provider than a, than a, than a CMS. It's usually built using, uh, for example, uh, Node.js or Symfony or Laravel. But what about using Drupal for, uh, for that role uh, on, on, the, on the stack? Um, so why? So basically first, because Drupal is very powerful at content modeling and content administration, uh, it provides a UI out of the box that is easy to use. It provides all the features that we, we all know and love, such as localization and internationalization, uh, advanced content edition and workflows. It's open source, and you have a large uh, choice of hosting providers to, to work with. But I also kind of few reasons to avoid Drupal on the front end side. Um, basically, if you want to use advanced front end techniques, uh, to use uh, more like newish text like React or Vue.js. Um, if you want to do more like an interactive experience with a lot of animations and transition instead of a page by page uh, kind of navigation experience. Uh, so basically if you want to avoid like page reloads, we want to kind of have the, the user stay focused on what you're doing. And also just basically the availability of the skills in your team. If you have a team that is like well versed in JavaScript and knows React, they're going to be more proficient doing an external front end rather than filling around with, with, with Twig, basically. So we're going to have a Drupal back end to do the, the, the back end stuff, and we're, we're going to have a separate web stack to do uh, everything front end and an API in between. So now we, we know we're going to use Drupal on the back end side, but what are we going to put on the front end side? Um, it's kind of important, but basically, any front end stack that can consume JSON data from an API run a data screen uh, would do. Um, so for that particular project, we evaluated uh, technologies like Tone, which for people who don't know, it's a kind of static site generator that is built for Drupal. But in order to build the front end, you have to know Twig. It's really a Drupal slash PHP uh, technology. Uh, we also looked at Gatsby, which is like a React-based, kind of an out-of-the-box um, solution, but very opinionated. And of course, the major contender were uh, Next, which is based on React, and Lux, uh, which is based on uh, Vue.js. Ultimately, uh, we picked Next.js. So the reason, is I, I, the reason why we picked Next.js is because, as I said, their internal team had prior experience in React, so we preferred that over, over Vue.js, uh, of course, they they had the, it was kind of, kind of obvious, but also when uh, we compare that to Gatsby, for example, it gave us a little bit more flexibility uh, be because of the kind of less opinionated way it, it works. And the last thing, it's probably the most important, is that the I mean the next GS uh, kind of stack is really really well integrated with Drupal uh, thanks to the, the hard work of the community of the Drupal Next uh, project. So now we settle on that kind of target of using Drupal and Next.js, what are we going to expect? So I 
talked about the fact that the React frontend would need to fetch data from the Drupal backend in order to function. When using um, that, that Next.js stack, we're going to actually be able to have uh, more performance, like a better performing uh, system, because instead of having uh, the front end dynamically fetching the data from the server every time a visitor uh, goes to the site, we're going to actually embed the Drupal, the, the data that comes from Drupal inside uh, the, the Next.js application. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the performance side of things. In terms of scalability, basically what's going to happen is that Drupal is going to be used to manage the content, but then because the content is going to be basically exported out of Drupal and be put alongside the Next.js artifact, there's going to be almost no traffic to Drupal itself from a visitor standpoint. Um, and what's required to host the Next.js side of things, very uh, lightweight because it's basically just a bunch of static resources that are uh, deployed uh, on the hosting uh, side of things. And we also expect things in the terms of a team organization because instead of having a unified team of Drupal developer that does a little bit back end, a little bit front end, we're really going to have two teams, like teams of Drupal specialists and team of React specialists. In a way, uh, we can see that as a um, as a better situation because sometimes it's easier to source uh, React front-end talent than Drupal front-end talent on the market, but it also comes with a management cost because there's going to be a little bit more resources to, to manage during the project. There's also an interesting thing about the fact that we're going to be able to improve the security of Drupal itself. Um, Basically, usually when we're, when we're building a Drupal website, the visitors are interacting with Drupal directly. So Drupal needs to be like, accessible on the open internet. In that case, the visitors are going to interact with the, the React artifact, the Next.js artifact. So the Drupal side of things can be almost completely locked down and only being uh, made accessible only for the uh, administrators. The actual technical way that we implemented that is to, we made the Drupal backend accessible over two different domains. So let's say, for example, a CMS dot your website and then a assets dot your your website. The reason we did that is that we we had the ability to say when the request is targeting that admin domain, then it's restricted to users that have administrative rights, to, so that we can restrict where those users come from. We can. Uh, uh, do what's called geo-blocking or geofencing to make sure that, for example, only um, connections from the US are allowed to access that domain because the administrator shouldn't be anywhere uh, uh, than in the US. Um, and for the other domain that is just for the purpose of accessing the assets, we make, we make that domain accessible for the whole world, but then we restrict what is actually accessible. So it's only going to be the prefixes where the media are stored and the prefixes of like allows uh, access to the API to retrieve the content, but there's, it's not going to be possible to access the UI through that secondary domain. And just as a, a little segue, uh, using that architecture allows us in the future to use the benefits of uh, something that's called prog progressive web apps, which um, okay. um, the, the, fa the fact that it is an external app and not just a Drupal website uh, makes it that we could potentially be able to use uh, things like offline capabilities. Uh, for example, that means someone already visited the website once, they can get back to the website even when they have no internet connection and the website can be still uh, accessible with a minimal, a minimal set of, uh, of features. We could have access to native features such as, uh, such as uh, geolocation or notifications and uh, we can also have access to features uh, like uh, background synchronization, which allows to, for example, provide uh, access to specific features while being offline. And then when the network is available again a few minutes later, then the synchronization can submit the data uh, in the background, even if you're not actively on the website. So those are features that are provided by the web browsers that are easier to use when the website is designed as an app rather than a, uh, a typical website. So, that was like the, the theoretical aspect of it. I have a question. 
<laughs> sorry, on the previous slide. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I haven't heard it before. Could you explain what specifically about a single page React app versus a traditional Drupal website that makes it more compatible with PWA? And you could, if you could repeat the question for me. So the question was why it is uh, easier to use the features provided by the PWA ecosystem when we build as like an independent application rather than using uh, Drupal itself. Um, the thing is, um, those features are really uh, built in order to build a web experience that looks like a native web application, basically. And Drupal is not a client-side application technology, which means if we want to build something that is going to use to be a PWA, we kind of need to bend a little bit how Drupal works by providing on every single page of the website the necessary bits of JavaScript and configuration and manifests so that the browser is going to believe that the whole website is actually just one application and not just a bunch of pages, which is doable and in some circumstances actually easier, especially when the website already exists and you want to apply that to only a subset of the pages. But for a brand new project, it's way easier to actually take the PWA standalone application route. Hmm. That's the answer to the question. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna dive in the application side of things. Is there any other question about the like, theory aspect of it? Yeah. You talked about hardening of Drupal. In that configuration, do you simply keep Drupal inside the firewall, or do you is there involved any other is there any other process involved? So the the question was in that kind of situation, uh, do we or can we keep Drupal behind uh, the firewall, so inside the internal network, basically, and not exposed to the internet? Yeah, is it what you do? To so it's not what we do because there's still a little bit of a runtime dependency on Drupal. The website still, still needs to uh, communicate with Drupal for reasons that we're gonna, we're gonna see uh, uh, in, the, in the next uh, uh, few slides. And also to fetch the, the different assets that were uploaded by the content editors because they're living on Drupal. So that, that aspect needs to be like, accessible on the internet. So it's not like behind a firewall in the network side of thing, it's more like behind a uh, web application firewall, if you like, it's, it's a, a WAF that we can, like, it's, it's open on the internet, but then we can restrict which IP are allowed to access that, that Drupal instance, or which prefixes are allowed to be accessed by the general public, and so on. So, on. <coughs> so how do we actually build that Drupal website? So, I kind of listed uh, the, the features that we need to to consider in order to have a successful build uh, of, of the project. So first, even, even if it's an app, uh, for obvious SEO purposes, we still, uh, we still need to be able to render the content that corresponds to a specific URL, like a specific meaningful URL, because, because even if it's a decoupable website, we want it to be uh, indexed by Google and shareable on the social networks and so on and so forth. So we need an app that is able to understand what the URL means and display the right content on the page. Uh, we also need to be able, even if it's a decoupled app, separate app, to administer the various menus that are presented on the website. We don't want those menus to be statically built by the developers and then each time you want to change a menu item, add one, disable one, you need to call the developers and they need to rebuild the app. We need to be able to manage that inside Drupal. And uh, also we need to be able to generate, what, once the content is ready in the, in the Drupal CMS, we need to be able to generate the final artifact and deploy that, that, that final artifact to the, hosting, uh, to the hosting provider. And of course, provide the administrative UI, provide the moderation workflow, but, and, uh, and content translation, but that's something that Drupal does uh, out of the box. So first, the modeling of the content. So for that, it's pretty typical. It's not different than uh, 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 a typical Drupal build, but, uh, a non-decoupled Drupal build, if you will. We just go ahead in the UI and we define our content types. 
uh, once they're defined, uh, Drupal is going to generate the configuration that corresponds to those content types, and then the front end team, the React team, is going to be able to build all the components, the visual components that correspond to uh, each of those content types. Uh, so those, those are basically the equivalent of the tweak templates that you would have uh, on your uh, typical Drupal uh, instance. And notice the fact that, for example, for the article content type, there are multiple components that match, and it's like the equivalent of a different display mode uh, in, in, in Drupal, that it's going to be the job of the front end to decide which uh, template to pick, depending on the context. Uh, that website is going to be using paragraphs for the page building experience, so it's kind of the same deal. We use this, the standard Drupal features, go ahead in the UI, define all the paragraphs, Drupal is going to generate, to generate all, those, all the configuration that is uh, needed for all those paragraph types. And in the same uh, vein, we're going to create React components for each of those paragraphs, which corresponds to basically their templates, like the way they should be uh, looking on, on the screen. And then comes something a little bit more interesting, which is how do we actually make the application render on the screen the content that corresponds to a specific URL? Because as I, as I, as I said for SEO reasons, for SEO reasons, we need to have, um, uh, like we need to be able to associate a meaningful path, a meaningful URL to each of the, of the, of the contents. For example, the about page needs to be, I don't know, slash about us. The, uh, if, if it's an article piece, uh, we need to have the term article in the URL, we need to have a part of the title in the URL and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but External applications, like a, like a React application that lives outside of Drupal, in order to render the content of a node, they need to be able to load <coughs> that content through the API. So they need to know what is the ID of the node in order to be able to connect to the API and say, hey, give me, uh, give me the content from, the, from that node. Um, in order to do that, there's a module, uh, contribute module called, called, called Decouple Router that actually, uh, that actually uh, does that. We're going we're gonna to see that through an example. So, the example is like, I mean, this one, for example, the slash post page, which is supposed to look like that in the, in the React app. The question is how the React app is going to determine which node it is, which node type it is, and so on and so forth. In order to do that, using the decoupled router module, Drupal is going to expose um, a specific service that the app is going to be uh, able to use, passing through the, the actual path of the page. It's, it's, like transmitted through the path parameter. And then that service is going to output uh, like a bunch of information, but most importantly, in the entity section, which, what, what is the type of that piece of content? That's a node. What type of node? It's a page. And uh, what, what's the ID? It's uh, 40, 43. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a 42 node. Uh, yeah. That's a bummer. Uh, and then equipped with all that information, the React application is going to be uh, able to say, okay, that's a node, that's a node of type page, so I'm going to go and fire up the page component and load the content that is associated to that node using, using the API and feed that to the, to the component. So as, we, as I said, the website is going to use paragraphs for the page building experience. For, for the content editors, it's going to be the typical experience of going to the ad admin UI, create those paragraphs that make up the page, fill the fields with the, 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 the required information. But on the React side of things, we're going to have something like this. Uh, basically, for each type of thing, we're going to associate a component implementation that is done in React. The first half of that list, on the, on the left side in green, that's the Drupal side, which is the way that Drupal is going to say it's an article or it's a service. And on the right, that's the name of the React component, the class, if you will, that is going to be, that, that, that has to be instantiated for that kind of content. The second half of the list is, is the same thing for um, for uh, the paragraph types. If we dive a little bit deeper, the actual implementation looks like this. And I'm gonna walk you through this, through that. It's not, it's not that, that complex, you'll see. That, that's, that uh, piece of code that we're seeing here is the um, Drupal page, um, the node page, uh, the node page uh, component, sorry, the, the, the blue uh, 
the, the two label on the, on the top. So that means it's the component implementing on React that should be displayed whenever we want to display a node of type page. And the implementation is pretty simple. Basically, inside an article tag, we're going to just iterate through all the paragraphs that are de defined by the content editors and that we retrieve from the API. And for each, we're going to go and look up the map that I just uh, showed in the previous slide and just create um, that instantiate that component for each of the, the paragraphs. Now about the menu. So as I said, I mean, on the, in the design, we had a nice menu on the top of the page. But we don't want the developers to go and build that menu inside the code base of the, the front end. And then each time you need to add new one, disable new one, you need to like, call them and ask them to make the change. Now, we want the content editor to have that menu defined in Drupal, and they have the freedom to change it whenever they want, associate every menu item to the, the, the actual uh, page, the actual bit of content that needs to be um, access. And in order to do that, on the Drupal side of things, there's nothing to do besides creating the menu as usual and linking uh, every item to the corresponding node. And then using um, a specific country called JSON API menu items, uh, Drupal is going to be able through the API to communicate the definition of the menu to the React application so it can be dynamically rendered on the screen. And uh, the, another interesting uh, bit from the Drupal perspective is that usually when you transition from the edit mode to the view mode in Drupal, you just basically see the actual page uh, in the, in the front-end uh, front implementation of that page here because the front-end is uh, actually an external app. What we're going to do is that we're going to just instantiate an iframe and start the React app with that specific URL that we're, I mean, the URL of the page that we're working on. And as we saw uh, earlier, the, the, the app is going to bootstrap, determine what is the content associated to that URL, load the content, and render on screen. That means we can provide the content editor an actual uh, ability to preview the content as they're used to with typical Drupal instance, even if it's a big Drupal app. So, now everything's good. We have a Drupal backend, we have a growing Next.js code base that is able to fetch the content and render that on screen. We need to think about how we're going to actually like, build that artifact and deploy it and manage it. So the Next.js framework provides like, the, the actual pipeline to trigger a build, fetch the content from Drupal, generate all the static artifact. It's basically just a command that you run, which is what the developers are going to run on the machine to have a working front end on the machine and do their work. But obviously, for production, we're not going to ask the developers to do that on their local machine and then push the artifact because we're not uh, in 1994 uh, anymore. <laughs> we're going we're to use a continuous um, integration environment. So in all cases, it's GitLab, but it would work with almost any uh, CI CD environment because it's just about calling that command to build the artifact. Um, by the way, the, there are actual hosting providers uh, um, that provide that as part of their Drupal uh, hosting uh, offering so that you don't, you don't actually have to build a, a CI CD system. And then the last, um, the last piece that means in that picture is that actually what I described just allows us to, whenever there's a code change on the front end, we're going to be able to rebuild and redeploy the front end app. But actually what we need is not to react to um, change in the code, but actually to react to change in the content. We want to be able to say, to, to provide the content editor a way to say, okay, I'm done with all my editing to all my nodes. I, I want to be able to push a button and say, that's not the time to rebuild the front end and push it to the live environment. And in order to do that, in order to do that, there's a module called uh, deploy hooks that is going to do exactly that. It's going to provide um, a button inside the Drupal UI that the content editor can reach to and click to basically repackage all the content updates, re rebuild the Next.js app with that updated content, and deploy everything to the, to the, to the server. The way it does, uh, the, the way it's working uh, under the hood, for example, if you're using uh, GitLab CI and you have your build pipeline configured, 
GitLab CI provides a specific URL that you can call to trigger a new run of that pipeline. So on the Drupal side, we're going to just give Drupal that URL, and whenever the content editor click on that button, it's going to call the pipeline, it's going to rebuild the React app, and it's going to deploy um, the final artifact. The nice uh, addition of that module is that it's actually able to track the list of all the content that were actually created or updated since the last time the website was deployed. That gives the content editor an ability to review all the pages that are actually going to appear or change on the website, and they're all like direct link to the admin side of things for that page, which provides a preview as we just, uh, at, at just, uh, as we just saw uh, uh, previously. So, everything's well, but as you know, there's always some, some shenanigans on the road, so we're gonna, we're gonna go over a few of those. So, the first is like the story about an expected content change. So we were pretty close to going live, and then we got a call uh, from the client and say, that's, that's weird, we were working on the content, and we never pushed that deploy button that we saw in the UI, and suddenly everything that we were doing was deploy on prop. So we kind of start to investigate what happened. And it turns out that, as we said, building the actual front end requires to pull the, the content from Drupal. And what happened is basically the team was working on releasing an updated version of the front end. And when they released their code, they triggered a new rebuild of the code, which unexpectedly fetched the latest content from the CMS that wasn't ready to go live yet. And that's what happened. Question? 30 minutes? OK, thanks. And the, 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 worst, the worst thing uh, in that situation is that because that rebuild was triggered by a code change and not by a change uh, in the CMS, the, the, the deploy hooks model was unable to notice. And then for, for the content editor, uh, it's, it really looked like the content weren't supposed to be uh, uh, deployed. Uh, so the solution to that problem is basically we, we completely cut the, the automated push to life for code updates. So whenever the code, the code on the Next.js application changes, it's just built, but it's never actually deployed because we want all the, the content update to be actually triggered by the content editor within uh, the Drupal uh, UI. It might be a little bit unclear. That slide might miss the indicator that it's a complex uh, topic. But if you think about sometimes there's a security patch that lands, and you want to apply that to your website, and you realize that your staging environment is not clean. Your staging environment is not deployable. There are like unfinished features or unreviewed features, and then you can't possibly deploy the application of that patch because it would also deploy features that are not reviewed. And that's, that's basically the equivalent situation that we were in, but for the content. Which is a nice reminder that you should always keep your staging environment in a deployable state. Um, the second like, problem that is inherent to the fact that we have a front end and we have a back end is that if we want to have a live and a staging and a dev environment for the back end, and we want to have a live staging and a dev environment for the front end, and we want to be able to test all the possible combination, we end up with like nine host names and nine configuration, which is not something that is possibly sustainable. So in our case, what we did is that we just said, okay, <laughs> the prod next JS artifact is going to always talk to the prod Drupal uh, uh, backend, same thing for staging and same thing for dev. If ever we need to kind of mix and match, it's going to only be possible on the development uh, on the develop, uh, environment. Uh, ultimately, what we would like to be able to do is to be able to fire up any of the front-end environment, so production, staging, or live, and tell that front-end to target a specific environment for the back-end so that we could be able to say, well, we want to fire the prod environment for the front-end, but we want to target the staging Drupal so that we can make sure that the upcoming Drupal really is not going to break anything. Same thing in the reverse, we want to have uh, that, that, that uh, an upcoming front end change to be able to target the production environment Drupal to make sure that everything's still working. And then. <laughs> we do get a 42. Of course. I mean, Snuck that in there. 
Huh? Snuck that in. Snuck that in. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's there's something to always remind, even if even if I manage to convince you that it's that it's a nice approach for for that kind of project. One project equals two projects. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, even if it's, if it's straight, provides a lot of features, it's always going to cost a little bit more than a typical Drupal-only project, uh, within the range of maybe 15 to 20 percent if it's a small project and you use it to practice to maybe 100 percent to 150 percent if you're actually new and start start the journey on on, on All right. So what's next? We're going to wrap up, I guess. That's what comes next. Comes next. Um, so in order to build that infrastructure, basically, we rely heavily on a lot of Drupal contributors. Here is a bunch of those, um, and as the website grows, there's, there's like more that we're added. For example, support supporting like Drupal views to be able to define listing of contents and expose that directly to the to the React app. And in terms of like the custom code that we had to write, we wrote no. The whole project relies on a Drupal instance that contains absolutely zero custom code. The only custom development on that project lives in the React app. And that's really thanks to the hard work uh, that was put by the community into the next project, which basically provide that way of like integrating an XGS front end with Drupal. So I guess that's going to be my final uh, statement, so that I consider that no Drupal as a platform uh, can be considered a no-code headless CMS that can compete with uh, most of the equivalent commercial solution out there, out there by actually providing you the benefit of being open source and uh, keeping you in control and, and ownership of, of your content. And I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions. Do you have any, um, I liked your slide about shenanigans because I did a uh, uh, decoupled site, but it also had user authentication. We used Drupal's users to authenticate them and provide some custom content. Do you have any um, feelings about using Drupal in that capacity or do you think it starts to kind of fall over? Because um, we ran into just problems with, like the CRSF token getting lost during development and then not being able to retrieve it after, and just like, and I really wonder, like, am I going down the wrong path with this? You know, but any, any thoughts or comments? So the, the question, I'm going to try to summarize it, is like, How is it if, you want, if, you want, if you want a non-anonymous, like an authenticated experience yeah. in that, let's say, React application, how do you do? Um, so I had experience with that in a, in a past life, let's say. <laughs> Uh, the, the answer, I mean, the, the way we use that was basically using all of. So whenever there's a need for authentication, we basically redirect the user to the Drupal backend, presenting a, like a styled version of the, only the, the login form, like using, I think, uh, the simple login module that just like, really like a strip down of the, of the form module. And then you, you're being redirected to the app with an authentication token that you can exchange and then use uh, the API. Hmm. It can. That's a whole can of worms that we're just that we just opened because uh, all of and all the all the authentication protocols they're just just they're evolving all the time. Um, and if you're building a React app, it's considered like a client that can't hold secrets. So you're basically going to be handed out a token that lasts, let's say, for an hour, and then you need to renew. And then all the techniques to be able to renew that token without breaking the authentication state requires a whole one hour session to be discussed. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you, in this project or in similar projects, consider how to automatically change the appearance of the front end if you change like the ND view display? Like not rebuilding everything every time? Right. So like, you know, if I said, oh, I'm going to reorder the fields of my article and add or remove, um, have you thought about how you would, have you done it, or have you thought about how you would automate that, so, so, so you get like an automatic front end? So trying to rephrase, like, can we expose the ability to configure the front end aspect 
like we usually do in Drupal, like reordering the fields and use that on. on yeah. Um, uh, so that's not something that we did. That's not something that I ever did in any instances. So usually for that, because I mean, it's when we're using that approach, it's usually because we want to provide like very custom and tailored, like animation based and like very rich uh, experience. So it's not necessarily the typical page based, like did I say boring uh, web pages? Um, <laughs> flexible. Flexible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, but that would be doable because basically everything that you configure in Drupal is an entity, it's a config entity. So in the same way that the Next.js app can retrieve the content entity, so the nodes, the taxonomy terms, and all of that can also retrieve the, the content types definition and the display mode definition and dynamically retrieve the order in which you want to put the field and use that to kind of, sure. like the, the loop that we see that goes over all the the paragraphs, that's actually that. You can reorder the paragraphs. So you could, theoretically speaking, do the same with fields. But I would say that if you want to retain such a tight coupling of your front end and your back end, maybe you shouldn't decouple. There were, yeah, other questions. Yeah, two, two questions. One, how come you're using deploy hosts? Only first question three, by the way. How come you're using deploy hosts instead of the API revalidation that Next.js has? Uh, maybe I didn't get the question correctly. So why do you talk versus? Yeah, the revalidation API. Oh, but the revalidation. So, so the question is about why did we use deploy hooks to basically trigger a pipeline, uh, like a CI pipeline, right. full-blown integration instead of using uh, what's, what comes with uh, Next.js. So you're probably referring to uh, incremental static regeneration? No, not, not quite. Not based on the time. Just based on an API request to Next.js to revalidate the content from Drupal. So you don't have to do a whole deploy to regenerate a whole list of content. You update one node and it automatically regenerates. Yeah, that's, a, that, that, that's kind of the same. It's like relying more on the backend side of Next.js to handle the rebuilding of that. Right. So the main reason is because the hosting provider was not supporting it. But that would ultimately be uh, the right way to do it, yeah. essentially. And the, o the other uh, answer. I know, that's why I'm <laughs> insisting on that. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure he knows. So. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so, so the, also the main reason behind that is not technically related, is because the client was willing to have a way to kind of atomically deploy a bunch of content. So they were willing to be able to edit a lot of stuff without that actively being pushed to the, the front end and say, now's the time to actually push everything. So that's why we did like, build something that dynamically, dynamically checked the contents updated. But we're still, I mean, in a way we're still using that for the preview mode. Like in preview mode, we're fetching the content dynamically for the, yeah. from the back. Second question? Second question was why JSON API instead of GraphQL? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, we, we, we could have done that. Um, but the point was to rely, like, three months timeline, we just went with what's in core, basically. Gotcha. It's just, and uh, that's basically what the next module relies on uh, the most. Like, a Next.js two-port integration, that whole suite of stuff primarily relies on, on JSON API. Yes? So, uh, my question might be better taken offline. Um, but it is around like what we can be supporting on Pantheon to better support some of these use cases, because um, I'm, I noticed you're statically rendering a lot of the output in this process. Um, uh, the main justification, as far as I can tell, is to remove the runtime dependency on the Drupal stack so that you can um, just have it be completely secure and resilient, etc. This is like a common issue. Like, um, in, in fact, I, I would say the most brittleness we see in decoupled applications typically comes from a really heavy dependency on the API provided by something like Drupal or WordPress where like every page makes X number of requests and it turns out like that you're not gonna get the decoupled scale if like every request is like creating one or more requests to Drupal. Um, but would you have taken a different path if you could basically have, uh, have um, captured the at, at the API level the representation of the content and then relied on that API being served in a way independently from group. Like, um, if we offered the ability to say, 
not just snapshot, but incrementally and automatically update the content um, in a GraphQL or JSON API representation that is not simply cached with the chance that the cache will miss, but actually guaranteed to actually have each of the pieces of content that have been published from the CMS. Would that solve your use case, or, or, or are you are you attached to static generation for other reasons too? That's a long and good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to rephrase that for the recording. Uh, we might actually want to take that offline for yeah, sure. Let's, let's uh, it, that. But it, it, that kind of like the mental model reminds me of actually how Gatsby work. Oh, yeah. basically fetching everything and present that in a unified way using GraphQL and stuff like that. I'm basically, here's the most succinct way I can phrase it. Um, basically providing something that, it, that works similarly to incremental static regeneration, but instead of it happening for the rendering of the pages, it happens for the actual assets powering the API. Mm -hmm. Where basically but, yeah. the API contains a snapshot that's incrementally fresh impressionable of the content, and then um, next, say, operates in a fully dynamic capacity where it, it relies on an API, but that API is not actually served by a group. It's served out of um, something where it's basically snapshot. Uh, I guess I'm going to have the most uh, engineering related question to that suggestion. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy to discuss it more. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any story or story stuff for the trenches? Oh. Yeah. We're all, we're all done. Alex, maybe first. And Given how much we love Pantheon and they've been hosting our website for six years, uh, what feedback would you give to uh, us beta testing Pantheon's next Drupal integration? Um, pretty good job. I wish the ISA work would be available. Yeah, that's um, basically. But but in a nutshell, yeah, no, I mean it just it just worked. I mean avoid it avoided us the need to have to evaluate and figure out that the different hosting providers, chat, I don't know, Netlify, Verso, or whatnot, so that we, we've been able to provide the client with a granulified hosting solution that comprised both the front end and back end, which for me was new because during my whole like, previous career in doing that, I always had to deal with like, a, 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 a hosting company for Google on one hand and something else for the front end. Yep. Um, and the only other thing I would add is all of our stuff, is, uh, the official stuff that we offer at Pantheon is all GraphQL based in terms of our caching our, for the API, the integrations, front end, back end. So we tend to tempt things more in that direction if you're looking at different options. And like, if you're particularly attached to JSON API, like, you won't get as deep of official support. Hmm. Okay. As you might already know there is going to be uh, like Drupal Conf like event happening in Atlanta yeah. next month. Golden Web same thing to organize organize that. Um, I, I highly encourage every one of you to consider uh, reviewing the program and, and attend. Uh, I mean, I think I'm confirmed that I'm going to be a speaker. If that helps you make the choice of <laughs> hearing me again about speaking about uh, migration and different things like that. All right, thank you very much for your attention.